Hello everyone and everything and welcome to Game Breakdown, where we're gonna start breaking down Sly 2, Band of Thieves, Sucker Punch's critically acclaimed stealth action platformer. This has always been a favorite of mine, so to show my affection, we're gonna do such a deep dive into it that we're gonna have narcosis when we're done. So, let's get started. Today we're breaking down the game's intro, slash tutorial, slash prologue, slash whatever you wanna call it. A shadow from the past, and that's as good a place to start as any. Who actually knew what this level was called? In order to find out, you have to beat the level, save the game, and then look at the file select screen before starting the first chapter. This level is so short that I seriously doubt any casual player actually finished it and went, okay, that's enough for today. Still, it's a cool name, with a couple double meanings. So, looks like we're in Cairo, the capital of Egypt. What a cool way to set the scene and tone of the game. I feel like Cairo gets pretty often overlooked as one of the world's largest cultural hubs, passed over in favor of many European and American cities, but we're here at its epicenter. A museum holding arguably the world's most valuable collection of art and treasures, and we're clearly up to no good. They didn't put the word thieves in the title for aesthetic purposes, we're already showing rather than telling. Okay, alright, I have to talk about this now. So, the footage you'll be seeing for these videos is going to come almost entirely from the Sly Collection, an upscaled version of the original PS2 trilogy bundled together on the PS3 by a company called Sanzaru. As is pretty well documented these days, Sanzaru attained the rights to Sly Cooper from Sucker Punch because they wanted to create a sequel, Thieves in Time. And as such, they weren't really interested in making this collection, but Sony had them do it for, well, any number of reasons. So what we ended up getting is some of the laziest porting jobs I've ever seen, with countless graphics designed for the PS2's 4x3 resolution just being left completely unaltered, and so... ending before going off screen. I'm playing this version because I do feel the higher resolution and brighter lighting are worth it for showing this game off, but if you see anything that looks a bit... Eh, you know why. This is the last I intend to mention it, so just don't come at me too hard if it comes up in later videos and I don't draw attention to it. Okay, let's get back into the good stuff. I swear we're actually gonna push a button in a second here, but god, I just love how this game does its title screen. This room slides in is actually the first room of the game, so when you press start on a clean save file, there's no loading screen, no menu, just boom, straight into the game. Breaker Alpha Foxtrot, this is the wizard. Do you read me, Sitting Duck? This is Peking Duck. I hear you, Blizzard. No, Sly, I'm the wizard, and you're Sitting Duck. I read you loud and clear, Lizard. No, I, I'm... Forget it, you're not taking this seriously. Yeah, I'm not. Look, Bentley, I know this is your first time out in the field, but you've gotta loosen up. If we're gonna get to those clockwork parts, I need you on your toes. So in plain talk, what's your status? Well, I've established myself in the basement, and I'm pretty sure I can rewire the service elevator if you can power it up from that security station. Hang tough, pal. It might take some time, but I'll figure out a way to get up there. Characterization is already coming at you thick and fast here. Sly being so blasé could easily come off as insufferably cocky, but you instantly see that it's for the good of the job, and that brings across Sly's own experience and expertise just effortlessly. Just mwah! Masterful. Okay, now we're in control, and I gotta say, I love this. They give you free reign to play around with Sly's buttery delicious controls here, but you also get very gently tutorialized. The way to your objective is to bounce on this whatever it is and across this giant whale skeleton. When playing as Sly, you almost always want a vantage point like this, and the game has already planted the seed for that mindset in your head. Okay, I splice the wires. Ow! Hold on. There it is. And then we have Bentley. Okay, okay, let me at that security computer. After spending the bulk of the first game being almost exclusively a tutorial giver, seeing him enter the field right here in the opening job is the first major tip-off to how much things have changed since the first game. There goes the laser security system. I'm working on the security gate. Presto, all clear. Thanks, pal. For your first time out, you did pretty well. Oh, this operation is far from complete. Now that the lasers and spotlights are offline, Murray should be moving into position for your rendezvous. I'll stay here and provide computer support while you go on ahead. It's nice to see how he's got our backs here, even if our faith might be a little shaken by this, uh, less than convincing PA performance. <gasps> Thank you! You're all doing a great job! 
Hey, you know what really help us keep a low profile? Yep, that'll do. Okay, this museum here is absolutely packed with easter eggs and references. Nearly every piece of art relates to some other bit of sly lore. You've got some members of the Fiendish Five, this picture from the Panda King's intro cutscene, various artwork and statues from Raleigh's treasury, several pieces of concept art made for the original game, including some with some of Sly's older designs, a few pieces of concept art for this game, and even some stuff from Sucker Punch's first game, Rocket, Robot on Wheels. Like this absolute masterpiece right here, where you can see some of the game's characters. And the name Whoopi World, which was the name of the theme park Rocket inhabited. Some people even believe Jojo the Raccoon here was the original inspiration for Sly's design. Pretty much every other painting we see here is something we'll see somewhere later in the game, but then there's this one which is just like a collage of random textures. Oh, and finally this one. I'd give the rest of these the benefit of the doubt if I were Sly, but if I saw a picture of just straight up me and my gang hanging in a museum that me and said gang are currently robbing, I would get the absolute hell out of there. It's either a setup or some weird Twilight Zone Dorian Gray scenario, and I want no part in either one. According to my information, the clockwork parts are being stored up there. Now to get access, you're going to have to meet up with Murray at the rendezvous point. Unfortunately, the route through the garden is filled with guards. No problem. I'll just take the long way around. If memory serves, you need to jump and hit the circle button to run along ropes. Ooh, the blue sparkles, man. This is just inspired. A simple, easy-to-recognize indicator for anything you can parkour on. I remember the first time I played the 2018 Spider-Man game, and I noticed these little indicators on corners, points, and rails, and I was like, hmm feels awfully familiar. Well, wait a minute! Okay, I love these pigeons, but also, if you don't scare them off and just watch, you'll see that they are 100% in sync. And between that and the painting back there, this would seriously not be passing the vibe check. Murray must have gotten lost along the way. Try pressing on ahead without him! Yeah, we could do that, Bentley, or we could... Thunderflop! Oh, ho, 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 and the big guy himself. Greetings, citizen. I hope you weren't harmed by my meteoropic entrance. No, Murray, I, I kept it a safe distance. Good, good. The Thunderflop knows neither friend nor foe, only destruction. Yeah, could you maybe channel some of that raw energy into the security gate? Of course. It is nothing before the Murray. My man didn't let being pink and pantsless stop him from taking names and kicking names also. Not just Murray, THE Murray rounds out our trio. And I love how much Sly hypes him up here. All clear! Another barrier stands before you. Fear not, I shall bend it like the truth. Solid work, Murray. You're really in the zone. My hulking frame is too much for that puny rope. You go ahead and unlock the doors from the inside. I'll be waiting in the hallway to help you carry out the clockwork parts. Murray was so completely timid and borderline useless outside his van in the first game. To see him take such a 180 here already feels good. That being said, I do kind of dock some points here, because I could definitely see this feeling like too much of a 180, you feel me? He got a passing line in the last cutscene of the first game about overcoming his fears, but I don't think we actually got to see any of the steps from point A to point B. Might feel like they just rushed an arc for the sake of having Murray on the front lines, but you know what? Even if that's exactly what they did, I'm glad they did it. Let's just imply a rocky training montage off screen and be glad the Murray is here. Okay, another thing though, how did Murray get here? We saw in the beginning we were all together on the roof of this building, but somehow Murray worked his way over to this one despite definitely not being able to cross these ropes, like we just went over that. Here's a thought, why didn't Sly go back on the roof of the first building after bringing Bentley up, and then both he and Murray just drop onto this balcony and he lifts this gate? Yeah, we're only five minutes into the game and I'm nitpicking this hard. This is gonna be good. Before going into this room and triggering the next scene, you can check out these blueprints on the back wall. You got Clockwork's skull, his heart, his wings, and his, uh... Sideways D-shaped organ. Yes, the most critical component of all mechanical owls. Indeed, you can't have a mechanical owl without one of those. I don't get it, Sly. The clockwork part should be here. This is all wrong. We need to pull the plug on this operation right now. Freeze, Cooper. 
Ooh, hello, we got coppers on the scene. Gotta love this ambush. Like, earlier today, Carmelita is like, Okay, I need a good place to stake out. How about inside those 4,000-year-old golden sarcophagi? And the museum curator is probably just like, Uh, I don't, you can't. But by then, she's already inside, and he's just like, Screw it, the better the sting goes, the more likely nothing will get damaged. Freeze! In all seriousness, this is another great introduction to two more of our key characters. Armelita and Sly have such a great rapport. I love how she doesn't remotely falter at him calling her beautiful. Inspector Fox, as beautiful and unpredictable as ever. Whereas you crooks are so predictable, you always return to the scene of the crime. Crime? I haven't stolen anything. Yet. Oh really? Then who broke in last night and made off with all the clockwork parts? You've got the motive. Someone already stole the parts? Don't play dumb with me. It might not have been him, Carmelita. The method of entry and guard casualties all point to this being a claw gang job. The claw gang? Constable Neela, I allowed you to sit in on this stakeout as a favor to the Contessa. I really don't need any help. Oh, I think you might. Look at the facts. Facts? Sly Cooper is right here. I caught him red-handed. I'm just saying that there are other criminals in the world other than... Sly Cooper! After him! And then we have Neela, the first brand new character we've met. And she's a fascinating wild card. She's obviously here on the same side as Carmelita to catch Sly, but it's because of her that we get away. It's not clear if she distracted Carmelita on purpose, but it's undeniable that she did distract her. Ooh, and we get a mention of the Contessa here. If you've only played the game once, I bet you forgot this is where she was first name dropped. But it makes for some pretty cool foreshadowing. After him! Alright, looks like we're in trouble. Hurry up, run for your life! Go, 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 go! But first, check out this cool Bandit King statue. It's actually a scaled-down version of the one at the epicenter of the Panda King's lair. That's pretty neat. Also, hey, Egyptian Museum, half these pictures are all just copies of each other. How'd you get away with that? Oh, right, I guess we're running from the law. Okay, here we go. Hey, come back here, Ringtail! This wasn't part of the plan! Yeah, well, this is where things get fun. Stop! Thief! This is honestly one of the game's defining moments. You got all the boys side by side, ride or die for each other, and their bond is brought across through gameplay. And Carmelita herself is a much clearer and more competent threat than she once was. Her shock rockets used to move at a snail's pace and fire so slowly, but now look at this. She's out for blood. This is where you really see this is going to be a very different game from the first. This is getting a little hot. You guys go warm up the van. I'll keep Carmelita busy. You're all going to jail. Pick me up at the rendezvous. You can't run forever! Yep, hang on Carmelita, Sly just has a lifelong grudge against the antenna he needs to settle. Also, check out these precision landings Carmelita's pulling off on these obelisks. This is some Ryoichi level acrobatics, and she's just doing it no problem? The game likes to play Carmelita and Sly off each other in dialogue to build up their relationship, but seeing Carmelita in action, and that she even has some abilities similar to Sly, is a subtle nod towards their compatibility through gameplay as well. Gotta love that. So I love how many police cars there are just already on the scene. This wasn't just a stakeout, this was a full-on sting, which makes me feel like this whole thing wasn't just set up as a he'll probably return to the scene of crime sort of hunch, but rather they 100% knew the Cooper game were coming tonight. I'm telling you, that painting of us, we should have bounced as soon as we saw it. Luckily, we're none the worse for wear. As Murray miraculously shakes this whole herd of pursuing vehicles, how do you even do that? And we make our escape. I'll find you, Cooper! Now, we get our first animated cutscene, and these are all a treat, so I'm just gonna shut up for a second. Carmelita's just as angry as ever. She's really quite lovely when she's angry. And that Constable Neela... Was a reference to the Claw Gang just a slip of the tongue? Or an intentional clue? Either way, it's her only lead on the missing clockwork parts. Clockwork. He was consumed with jealousy for the Cooper clan's thieving reputation. Is it inappropriate to refer to him as a monster? No, not at all. What kind of person stays alive for hundreds of years with the express intention of wiping out a rival's family line? Imagine the hatred fueling that first decision to replace his mortal body with soulless machinery. Ultimately, it did the trick. Clockwork lived on. He caught up with my parents. 
and I wound up in an orphanage. It's there that I met my pals, Bentley, the brains of our outfit, and Murray, the brawn. They turned out to be all the family I needed. Two years ago, I thought I'd finished it. How naive to think I could so easily put an end to that kind of hatred. And now he's back. In pieces, sure, but the threat is real. Does the Claw Gang even realize what they've stolen? God, the presentation here is so styling, man. The inspirations here are clear. A super confident comic book aesthetic that's both fun to look at and concise. So much information is conveyed in all these panels, yet none of them are overloaded with details. You've got some great blink and you'll miss it moments in here too. Like the museum with its glass pyramid rooftop in the opening shot. And Paris off in the distance as we drive off. And then you've got the Cooper Ancestor roll call here. We know half these guys from the first game. Tennessee Kid Cooper, Otto Vaughn Cooper, Ryoichi Cooper, and Slight in Common. The other five we didn't know until the third game, but we have the 40 Thieves inspired Salim Al Kupar, the piratical Henriette, the gentlemanly Thaddeus Winslow Cooper III, this absolute unit Slay McCooper, and finally the knightly Sir Galleth Cooper. Now, as good as the attention to detail has been, I do have to be that guy right now and point out that Sly definitely has six fingers on his hand right here. Okay, one final major character intro to touch on this chapter, Clockwork. I've been skirting around him this whole level despite several mentions of him, but we've gotta talk about how effectively he's set up. The greatest threat to the entire Cooper lineage. We tore him apart and left him in the center of an active volcano and it still wasn't enough. He told us in the last game, we'd never be rid of him, and it looks like he's still having the last word. I don't know what's in my future, but I won't let it be a repeat of my past. <laughs> what an intro. Really gets you hyped up for the adventure ahead. Despite every nitpick I could throw its way, there's not a weak moment here. Every line serves either as excellent characterization or establishing the plot. Not a word is wasted. The first half really helps you feel Sly's competence as a thief, with guards patrolling the halls around you and the public rushing around on the roads beneath you. Like you're pulling off this heist directly beneath everyone else's nose, effortlessly slinking from vantage point to vantage point. Then the whole script is flipped at Carmelita's entrance, and that last chase is just exceptional. A brilliant open Opening and we've only just begun. Next up, we're going to be breaking down episode one, The Black Chateau. See you then.